morning, everyone, and welcome to your Scottish Parliament. I'm delighted to welcome you to the session on artificial intelligence and creativity. My name is Maggie Chapman, and I'm a Scottish Green MSP for the Scottish Parliament. But today I'm here as a board member of Scotland's Futures Forum, which is the Scottish Parliament's think tank. And th this session today is, is hosted by the Futures Forum um, as part of the Festival of Politics. This year, the Festival of Politics is celebrating its 20th year of conversation, discussion, debate, sometimes argument. Um, so I hope that you will enjoy today's session on creativity. And j just so you know, if, if you want to, please do engage with our social media. Um, on, we're on Instagram as at Scott Powell and on X or Twitter as at Visit Scott Powell. So if you want to engage with that as, as we go through today, please do. This session is being recorded and not live streamed, but it will be available on the Scottish Parliament's YouTube channel in a couple of weeks' time. So you can you can find out if, if you miss anything or, um, or you want to look back at anything, it, it will be there. So I'm delighted that, that you're joining us today uh, for, for the session, and I'm very pleased to have a, a panel of experts and interested people. Um, we've decided that some of us are definitely not, not experts on this, um, but uh, very pleased to be uh, joined by Professor Frauke Zeller, by Rosie Castle, and by Michelle Thompson, MSP. Professor Frauke Zeller is Chair and Professor of Design Informatics and Co-Director of the Institute of Design Informatics at the University of Edinburgh. Her research expertise includes methods for big data analyses in audience analytics, AI ethics, and human-computer and robot interaction. Rosie Castle is Campaigns Manager at Edinburgh International Festival. She works across the international festival's marketing channels to promote the celebration of world-class performing artists. And Michelle Thompson, MSP, has, a long, ha, has had a long career prior to entering politics, encompassing music, IT, financial services and research before being elected to the Scottish Parliament in 2021. And she is convener of the cross-party group on music. So please join me in welcoming our panel this morning. So, Frauke, if I can start with you. you. You've undertaken research on AI in, in the creative industries across the sector. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What, what, what are some of the key themes that have come out of, out of your research? Um, yes, thank you, Maggie. Um, so, with a, with a big team, which is um, within the project of creative informatics, and you can all go, we still have a wonderful website, creativeinformatics.org, and you can also download the report. It's, it's here. It's available um, free of charge um, as a PDF. So we wanted to know, um, as a creative AI demonstrator project funded by HRC and DCMS, um, we wanted to know what um, Scottish professionals in the creative industry, so creatives basically, what did they think about AI? Um, that was in 2023, so it's very um, recent basically. So um, we arranged for a couple of, for four workshops in Edinburgh, um, Dundee, Glasgow, and one online workshop, and we conducted also a survey. Um, and we worked with them basically and asked them what they thought about AI, how did they use AI or not use AI, um, where they saw challenges, and what kind of needs they, they saw basically. And it was very interesting, the outcomes. Now, I have to see basically, or I have to say that those that would come, obviously, had already an interest probably, otherwise they wouldn't have come, right? But we also had, I have to say, when you do these kind of studies these days, it was a quick turnaround. We only had, we had less than a year or so. Um, you have all kinds of challenges. If you conduct a survey, you have all kinds of bots, right? So artificial um, survey participants basically that fill them out, so a lot of surveys we couldn't use. We found out when you conduct, or when you do an online uh, workshop, we had also lots of bots that participated that we had to say sorry, but we can't use you, were pro, right? Were they pro AI? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they were very polite, yes. And we're saying very funny things suddenly, which where we realized, wait a minute, you know, are you really a person? Um, so um, that's, that's a whole different story um, that um, some of my colleagues are now analyzing and, and, and writing up um, uh, a publication about. But it was quite interesting to see. So we had quite a few had 
used it a little bit, but most of them who came were quite intrigued, actually, and wanted to know more about it, right? And so we worked with them during the in-person workshops. Um, we asked them several questions, and we said, basically, so what do you think? How would you use that? How would, would you design, try to design a certain tool, try to design, design a certain scenario where you would use that? And um, what was interesting to see was that very often they say, well, yeah, no, we would like to embrace that and we would like to use that, but mostly as a tool to help us, to support us in our daily works, to basically buy us more time to be creative ourselves, right? Um, which was quite interesting to see. And we had quite a few interesting outcomes to really show that we want to be involved. Our recommendations that you can also see, we had quite a few recommendations, but basically is. So creatives need to be involved in this whole AI development and the development of regulations, which are quite essential. I think we all can agree to that. Um, in terms of um, how can we do this in an ethical way, in a way that's sustainable, in a way that is fair, right? Um, and um, how can we offer the necessary training courses on all kinds of levels for those who don't know anything, for those who know a little bit, for those who know a lot about it. We also had some companies participating saying we want to know more about the needs of creatives. We want to know, we want to learn more about their hesitations maybe, their, um, how they find it critical or what they don't like about, the, uh, about AI, right? So how can we start community centers where we can start dialogues, for example, right? Um, a lot of creators also, creatives also said, we find it difficult to find training opportunities. Where do we start looking? How do I start even knowing about what kind of training do I need, right? So there's quite a few um, recommendations we made, and that was interesting. But what I found interesting was there is interest. Of course, there's also a lot of fears around that, Right, and those fears are quite serious and they are justified. Um, but there's also ideas. There are fantastic ideas from creators what they could do with AI and what could be done with it. Right, so we have a source, a ri very rich source here. I mean, I think we know that Scotland has a fantastic source of creativity, right? And Scotland, the creative industries in Scotland is very rich and is a very big driver in, in the Scottish economy as well, right? And Edinburgh is a very good example, right? A AI and creative industries in Scotland both are very important economic factors. Um, so I think it's very important that we bring this together. And I was very excited when I was invited to be part of this panel and thinking about what could we do if we talk also about, we have Michelle Thompson here, politics. We have someone here from the International Festival. There's so much that could be done with us here together. Thank you very much. I think that, that sets the scene very nicely, particularly the questions around the, the, the possibilities and the opportunities that, that AI can, can present. Rosie, in, in, in your work, and yeah. you, you've, you've spoken and been involved in, in a conference session on AI as well within the creative industries. Yeah. What, what, what are some of the things that, that, that the people you've, you've worked with, either in the festival or elsewhere, mm -hmm. are, are saying about AI and yeah. where it goes? I think what well, you're saying about like the opportunities and the fears, I guess, I think at the moment, um, a lot of us who work in the creative industries are maybe putting our heads on the sand a little bit. Um, there was maybe, I think that we've seen that um, if you look at what ChatGPT, for example, can write now, it's, it's good. It's very good. And it's, <laughs> it's quite scarily good when that is mostly your job. And... Um, so I think that, as you were saying about wanting to use AI as like a collaborator, as something to help us, so that we have more time to be creative, um, is definitely a feeling that, that I have and other people have. I think at the moment, the way I look at something like ChatGPT, it doesn't seem to me like it's designed to help me in my work, because I guess, or I think the way I see it is I can use it for like editing. I think it's really useful for like, um, if you have a long text, like summarizing it or like pulling out quotes from that or, um, you know, you've written something, you just like, you've got to 
writer's block and you're like, let me just put it through this. And you're like, that's worse actually. Okay, so that makes me feel a bit better. <laughs> or like now I know what I don't want. Um, but I think that my feeling is once people higher up are aware of how good it is, where does that leave us? And, and I suppose we saw the example of that in, in the States, didn't we, with, with the yeah. writers' yeah. strikes, um, uh, because, you know, they, 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 they were striking because they were being made or they thought they could be made redundant as, as a consequence. So, so I suppose that they, there's a difference then, isn't there, between the, the sort of generative AI that can produce things, that can yeah. write scripts, that can yeah. potentially, you know, produce... Um, visual art, although some, some of the pictures that AI well, could have that very, very was wet. what came out of it, definitely. That's okay. where they see AI as a tool to help, as an okay. instrument. Uh, we also have some example, examples, of course, where AI could do some so much more. But I, I have to underscore here that this is also something where I see um, the need, obviously, of, of more... We have to work hard in terms of um, redundancies that will happen and can happen of creatives, of other jobs as well. I see there's a not, many different areas, journalism, yeah. for example, right? So um, um, that AI takes over over jobs. I mean, we had this happen so many other times in, in the past that, you know, machines take over. Um, this is terrible. So what we have to do, we have to, we have to work with the people and see um, how can this mitigate it, how can... Um, what can be done, basically? Mm -hmm. This is not an easy, this is a wicked problem, as we say now, right? Yeah. How, can, how can we handle this and not just look away, basically, what has been happening most of the time in the past couple of years? But let's be frank, this caught us all more or less by surprise, I think, mm -hmm. right? But this happened now a couple of years ago, and we the disc. Well, yes, yes, we're still playing catch up. We're still waiting. Um, and this is a bit of a shame because we should really be a bit further. And if you look at some of the technology that has been developing in the past few years in other areas, for instance, in cryptocurrency, etc., there is fantastic technology, mm -hmm. right, that now can be used to guarantee provenance, um, uh, etc. And why is that not being used in the creative industries, for example, you can ask, right? So, Thanks. Michelle, bring, bring you in now. You've, you've got a, a wide range of interests uh, that, that, tie, that can be tied back to AI. And I'm, I'm just curious, in, in either in the cross-party group that, that you chair or in some of the other conversations you've had around, you know, the, 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 the creativity potential or, or not within AI, where, where do you see some of the challenges and some of the opportunities in, in this. Uh, if I can give the audience a little flavour of the somewhat curious kind of career journey I've had and then answer that question. I started my life as a professional musician and became a very early adopter of technology when those of you who remember the introduction of MIDI ports and computers, it was quite revolutionary at the time and I ended up using technology to compose music in a theatre and that got me interested in tech and I went off and did a, a master's in IT and, and I've always remained my, continued my passion for music and I've been involved in business and technology for, for many years. So I've got perhaps a slightly unusual take on it in that I can see both opportunities and I can clearly see threats as well. And I had triggered a, a debate in the Scottish Parliament uh, here about the advent of artificial te uh, technology to try and uh, bring it into more the forefront of legislatures. And I, I opened my remarks by commenting that AIs like quantum physics, if you claim you understand it, you're merely proving you don't. Mm -hmm. Because such is the pace of change, particularly with generative AI, I think that we know that many, many sectors are going to have a significant challenge. Now, in terms of the creatives, what I saw with early adopters of technologies, that opportunity to start to mess around, to use a technical term with sounds in terms of sampling it and really arguably distorting it, enabled much greater creativity. And I tell you what, it really saved me a lot of time as compared to the old-fashioned route of writing the dots on a manuscript paper. 
Uh, so I can see the opportunity for saving creatives time, but I have to say I'm a little bit dismal in that the threats, I believe, are absolutely considerable. I think it's generally fair to say that it's underestimated the scale of the revolution that is coming. So it will clearly have an impact on people's jobs on the wider labour market as well. And there's a whole long list that I think we might want to talk further about. But if I can just introduce one further element in what I see these threats, I come from a background where music moves me deeply, frankly, in a way that nothing else does. And that's why it's been a continued and sustained passion. Yet, what will become of us as humanity when much of our music is created by a machine, probably considerably more homogenized. We're already quite used to hearing some very similar sounds. What will that mean of us? And what will that mean to that wider infrastructure for creatives? I'm very much into classical music. I love Mahler, Stravinsky, Wagner, and some of their works literally feel as though they're pulling my heart out. And if we become, it becomes commonplace that all we hear is music that's been developed by machines, what will that mean for us as human beings? A last wee point on that is I suspect that live music will continue to be sustained because I still at this stage struggle to see how AI can replicate the exactitude of a down bow and a violin. And if you're really into it, I mean, I can listen to the opening of Mahler 5 and I can tell you which trumpet player is playing a particular solo because of their particular and distinctive sound. So I think that will be hard to replicate. For many, any other stratas, is going to be very difficult. And therefore, for young musicians coming through, if the whole business is being t turned around in its head, where will be the functioning ecosystem for them to be able to perform live? That, 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 that's interesting. And my, my father was a musician, and I remember him resisting um, CDs. He said, you, you, you just don't get the sound. You don't get the sound quality that you would on vinyl. And I mean, of course, he was right. But, 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 but there is something about the, what, what gets lost, what, what gets lost. And, and Rosie, I wonder, in, in your conversations with people either directly engaging with the International Festival or, or, or in, in that space, what is it that you hear from classical musicians and, and others around their fears and, and, and hopes? Are, are, is it similar to, to what Michelle has yeah. outlined there? I, I was at a classical music conference and um, I think uh, the fear there was yet about the kind of AI-generated music. There's a platform called Suna. Now I'm giving them a shout out, but um, that's pretty much it. It kind of looks like Spotify. Uh, you can just put in your prompt, so you can say create a piece of music that um, you can't say like it sounds like Marla, but if you say like it sounds like Majla, it will play something that sounds like Marla. Um, and so, so yeah, um, so to kind of get around copyright, um, and it will quickly yeah generate this music very quick, like, yeah, in a few seconds, which sounds quite generic. And um, this was like played at the classical music conference um, and everyone was like, no, no, that sounds, that one sounds like AI, but we kind of also played a more contemporary classical piece that had been created by AI and people were a bit more unsure on that one. Because as you're saying, obviously a lot of music does have technology involved in it, but it's still got a human involved as well. I think, the fe I think the feeling there was it doesn't sound like good music, but it does sound like something that could be used as in an advert or it could, you know, rather than having to pay for the rights to use a piece, you can just pay like, a, you know, a £10 subscription a month or whatever it is mm. and generate as much music as you want and then you use that for all of your adverts or whatever, yeah. Is, is there a risk that we, we I mean... Music is is maybe maybe a, maybe different to to some of the other creative industries around around authorship and, and and that kind of thing. Is there a risk that we we lose some of the the ability to understand a lineage of authors, authorship and the development of form and and the you know the development <coughs> of 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 different types of and and styles of, of music because. 
uh, a generative AI is just going to take a whole host of information and smoosh it all together, technical term there, um, and, and, and come, come out with something that actually, you, you know, Michelle will, will know this you, you, very clearly, you, you, you can trace the lineage of different forms of music through, through, through a time. AI distorts that, well, does it? Or? I think, well, I think there is definitely a risk, but then Michelle is definitely an expert. Right? No, I think not. 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 Ever. I. 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 I don't know how many people here could do that. I. I couldn't do what. What you can do. I can only. I can only enjoy when I sit and I. I love classical music too, but I couldn't do what. What you can do for sure. But I think there also in that also. I think education plays a, a big role. I'm. I'm originally trained as a linguist, for instance, and I see, for instance, I mean this brings us a bit far from our topic here, but just an example. What the UK politics have done to eliminating foreign language teaching mm -hmm. in schools, right? So the idea of not knowing anything about grammar, for instance, and not teaching any foreign languages, right? So when you ask, you know, pupils in school, what is a passive voice or things like that? This is quite shocking to me, for example. So anyone who, who studied foreign languages in school has no problem with grammar. So, so but that, that is something also where we can see where, again, politics can play also a vital role in trying to, to work against certain trends, right? But there are also always trends where we feel like we can't also counter what then youth will pick up and, and do themselves or will think, but this is what I like now, this is what I prefer, right? For example, instead of talking to each other, they just, you know, two of them sit in the same room and they text each other, things like that, right? Um, so, um, but again, I can see how this is taking this whole thing a bit too far. But there's this thing with the um, going to that um, platform and just, um, you know, copying music. We have one project in, in our, and we, we funded um, um, parts of that, um, the combobulator, and they are, you can build an artist's brain. And the, the great thing about this is, and it's, a, it's, an, it's basically, they give royalties 50% to the artist. And it's someone that you can then build your own music based on that artist's ideas, basically, right? And background. So there are ways how we can you know, make this a fair deal for the creative. So we have with, with some initiatives, you can bring in initiatives and there are people, fantastic people, that have ideas, great ideas, business ideas, and they are creatives themselves who come up with new ways how we can use AI, come up with fantastic things and people can build new things and be use generative AI or other forms of AI and do new, you know, crazy stuff if they like it, artificial music if they like it, if they wish, and yet it's fair for both sides, right? And <laughs> they and they respect copyright and they respect everything. So why don't we try to bring this up to another level then? And nobody needs to lose their job, yeah. right? Uh, so, so, I mean, the, the, you're speaking there very clearly of the, the need for coherent regulation and, and, and controls around this that involve right from the start, as, as you said in your opening and remarks. New business models as well. New business models yeah. and, but community voices being, being involved yeah. very, very clearly in yeah. that. And I think one of, the, one of the challenges, we had a session yesterday on the lega legality and ethics of AI. And one of the challenges, particularly with generative AI, is there, nobody's seeking to control it. The, it uh, the, the power is very much in the hands of a very, very few wealthy, usually white, usually men. And what does, what does that do as well to the, the, the sort of cultural biases or, or societal biases around sexism, around racism? Do you, do you see that being a potential challenge for uh, the arts and creative industries as well? Or is it... Uh, yeah. yeah, I think we were talking about this, this earlier, but um, I think there's, there's obviously there's a more awareness now about um, kind of data bias and uh, we were talking about how um, yeah when when these companies have tried to use AI in order to like recruit people into jobs it's been 
the information that they've given the AI has actually been biased. For example, I think it was the example with, with Amazon where they, they kind of trained the AI on their best employees and all of their top employees were men. And so then the recruitment thing basically just didn't, was like, no, we don't need to hire any of these women because they don't match the information I've been given. Um, so I can't remember what the point now was. But I think people are more aware of that, but at the same time, the, the tech is still being created by the same companies that control the internet and basically con control our lives to some extent. But Microsoft, Amazon, um, Apple, it, it's, it's the same companies that are behind all of these new tech. So it's the, the, like the organizations like that you were talking about run by creatives. I think that's great, but we, yeah, without regulation, we're not really gonna be able to get into the industry. Michelle, do you think there's, there's an opportunity for Scotland to, to showcase the possible of, of, of creating that community-led, the, you know, the, the, the community of, of creatives themselves leading the, the, the kind of model of what, what, what we want that is fair, that's sustainable, that's ethical? Do you think, or, or do we lack some of the tools or the knowledge? or the or, well, well, given my opening statement clearly, um, we are in a position where technology is rushing ahead of us and most of us I think in the audience will be aware of the letter in 2023 that was signed by about 30,000 people warning of the, the dangers of AI including some of the leading tech people and I think if we take if we break it into various levels the good thing about Scotland is that kind of everybody knows everybody and the not so good thing about Scotland is everybody knows everybody <laughs> and, and perhaps it's a similar analogy when we look at AI we've got some great work going on here we're very high on tech we are very positively focused on AI with our institute we've got great universities we've got a great creative sector and so on so we could create an ecosystem and, and, and actually arguably I would suggest off the back of this session, I think we should be doing something active between politicians, between creatives, between the regulatory framework and between academics and between the tech sector to talk about that. Because <coughs> yes, we could do that, but the big elephant in the room is regulation. And it goes back to the point you make. At the moment, YouTube, for example, has open access and you can lift samples of music off YouTube and cobble together something else. And musicians are happily or rather unwittingly giving away their intellectual property that can be mopped up by AI. So regulation is a huge elephant in the room. And frankly, various legislatures, I, in preparation for this, I looked at what various countries were doing around the world. And in reality, people are adopting certain principles, for example, that's fine. I think there's, we're getting more commonality around the principles, but each state is doing something different and often they're doing it to their own priorities. And as far as I can see, the priority for creatives is not as high up in the agenda when you look at the implications of AI, for example, on defence and health. And, and maybe that's arguably understandable. So we could do something, but that elephant in the room of regulation and critically how you protect the intellectual property of people who are making their living from generating music, even if they're doing it very creatively, because I can definitely see an opportunity where you're actually using, if you have a knowledge of traditional forms that you outlined and you're using AI, because music for, for generations has been about breaking that apart and over layering it again, you can really come up with something remarkable, but it's a regulation. And I'm less optimistic, I would say, for you about how musicians, and I am sorry for focusing on musicians, I, I probably know a wee bit more about that. I'm less optimistic because particularly jobbing musicians have been finding things very difficult for a long time. They continue to do, and especially women in music, they are discriminated against. They make it's harder for them to make their voices heard. So I see the challenges, but very significant but what can we do and I do think we need to be getting bodies together and talking about it and I which is one of the reasons why I wanted this debate in the Scottish Parliament I'm not aware either in Westminster I spent a little bit of time there or indeed in the Scottish Parliament that there's even the understanding the limited understanding I've managed to develop. Thanks Michelle. Uh, Franca um, just just that on, on that point of uh, 
authorship and, and uh, um, intellectual property rights. How, how, what kinds of conversations came out of your research uh, uh, around those? Were there were there concerns? And and because the regulatory framework will have to be at a UK level, not not at a Scot Scottish level, because of of devolution. How how do we begin to to do some of the things that Michelle suggested we need to do? It's 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 very tricky, and I, I actually went to a really interesting <laughs> event yesterday at the uh, at the book festival, um, uh, where very interesting questions were brought up because when it comes to, especially when it comes to creativity and and, and AI and copyright and um, so is you know can AI produced creative products can they be copyrighted you know mm -hmm. can anything can that but can anything produced with AI or can something that is just made through AI can that be copyrighted because anything that's not you know um, rested in something human cannot be copyrighted. We know that, right? So, so it is not that um, trivial. Actually, it's quite it's quite interesting. So there was an expert in in, in these legal aspects, and, and it was quite he was actually quite entertaining. He was fantastic. So it was very interesting what he was saying. So, um, so that brings up all kinds of and then even philosophical questions, right? So at what stage? So how much AI can you use? Um, mm. until it becomes, you know, too much AI and then it's not you anymore and then you can't copyright it as yeah. yours anymore. So well, these questions came up mm -hmm. and it's very interesting. And as obviously you can see here, I'm, I'm an academic. I find that really fascinating, <laughs> right? So, and, uh, because I don't have to make my living from mm. by this, right? So, um, but these are questions that were asked and this is, is important questions that, that we need to ask them. So, because you can use AI as a mere tool, right? Um, you, but you can also use AI um, at first to generate ideas, but then you can use AI or to tidy up your databases, um, to tidy up your, your workroom or whatever, um, your desktop, but then you can also use AI to really produce um, an image, right? Mm -hmm. So without doing it yourself, we've seen um, fantastic images being produced and even winning prices, right? Photographs using AI, is that something you can is that even a photograph? photograph? Is yeah, that even a yeah, photograph, yeah. right? So Boris Elderson said we should have an own category for this then, mm -hmm. right? To be fair and to declare it as an own category, which I, to a certain extent, agree with. But then I'm not an artist and, and photographer, so I'm not even sure if I should have an opinion on that then, right? So, um, but... Um, so yeah, so that, those were those opinions, the more questions about questions. that. Um, how do we do that then? Um, how do we copyright this? And But the main advice that came up yesterday, and this is also my personal experience, because I had created in the past a, a famous robot and we tried to copyright it and then basically we gave up because it was too difficult because it was an internationally renowned <laughs> robot that was traveling internationally and it would have ended up being too expensive for us because mm -hmm. you can do it only per country, right? Okay. So, and so basically that's what the experts yesterday also said. But copyright basically at the end of the day for the individual artist is too difficult, mm -hmm. right? Those that if you find a way to find a solution for the copyright problems when it comes to AI and everything, only companies at the end of the day publishers, etc. they will benefit. Mm -hmm. The individual artist, it will trickle down, but will only get a few, like, you know, when you publish or something books, you will get a few little royalties, unless you're J.K. Mm -hmm. Rowling or something, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that that's not going to be that yeah. useful yeah. for the individual artist as usual. And I think, yeah. oh yeah, I've been told that as well. <laughs> and um, I think on a similar vein, I guess the, I think the main risks are for people trying to who are starting out, yes. who are trying to get into the arts industry, or who are, who are freelance, or those are the people who are really most at risk of because I think at the moment people are not being necessarily in Scotland being made redundant yet, but maybe people are going to say, well, we don't need to bring in another assistant because we can just use. AI to do some of that and so I think 
that's my concern that it's it's already so hard to start out as an artist or, mm -hmm. yeah nevertheless i still find i don't want to be misunderstood here, I still find we need to find a solution for yes, copyright, yes. right? And, and, yes. And I suppose, I mean, I, I said earlier about regulation at a UK level, actually, from what you say, it's something that transcends yes. state boundaries. It, it yeah. needs to be at a transnational yes. yeah. level. And maybe there's, I mean, we know we know from, from other things that European regulation can actually create global global change and, yeah. and global anxiety about, about how, how big companies can respond to it. But sorry, Michelle, did you want to come uh, in? Perhaps I could allow myself to be positive, uh, which will be a, a new departure, I think, during this panel. Uh, perhaps uh, one of the, the good things about creatives is that they're creative. And if they have an idea and somebody pinches it, they'll promptly have 10 uh, and they'll go along with it. And that, that's one of the things that I found. It's going to be a grand old shake-up for them as well. And one of the things I noticed, which I outlined this curious career history, one of the reasons I was interested in business was when I started off as a kind of young professional pianist, I was quite clearly aware of the things that you talk about in business, about where was my market? What, was my kind of, what were my price points? How was I differentiating myself? How was I going to be able to market myself? And as I spoke to other kind of musicians, they were like, well, what are you talking about? I just play the piano. And of course, musicians generally have had, really had to get up to speed with these questions because it's a competitive marketplace. And if we think here's a potential idea about using AI, where you can take, per, say, an example, an older person's artifacts that depict their life, and you could create a unique, bespoke package of music based on how they've lived their life. You could set that up a business and protect that idea and put it around all the care homes wherever you are. So you're still the guiding light in terms of the creator, but you're using AI to gener generate sufficiently good content to appeal to the older person. So there are positives there, but I'm making the point about the type and nature of thinking, particularly for young people, about how they run themselves as a business and in corporate AI. So there are opportunities as well, as I, you've said. I fully agree, and this is also something um, I, I, I agree with that, and I agree that with the ideas that they have to really, but they need the support to to help them um, basically t to turn this into a unique business idea. Mm. Um, and with that, we need the help basically to say, okay, they need to come to different centers that then pr pr can provide that support in terms of write the business plan to say, this is a great idea. This is how you turn this into a unique business idea. This is how you can protect yourself. Then, basically, yeah. right? Um, I fully agree. This is how this is how you can do that. Because yeah, what do you tell young people now who want to start up, who have an idea, who are creatives? Um, because we need to think about that. Yeah. Um, because there will always be. That's the good thing. There will always be young people who have great ideas, who want to be creative, yeah. and we have to think about them. What can we tell them? Yes. And, and if you think back to. How uh, this differentiation principle? You can see, you can see a point where humanity. We might decide that we place a value on music that is pure, and uh, perhaps that's not the right word. That human beings have developed, and we, as a society, are then ultimately willing to pay a premium for that, as we might pay more for organic vegetables to protect ourselves uh, as well. But again, regulation. Uh, will help and support that. and But we do need to be thinking much more about the nature of us as, as human beings and what that means. And again, I'm referring to, to music. And, and, and also, I mean, I suppose with that example, it's developing the, the, the frameworks around that so it doesn't become an exclusive. The, 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 the pure, and, and mm. I appreciate what you say about whether that's the right word, but the, the purity of, of human-created music doesn't become the, the, the privilege of... Yes. of uh, of the elite. I'm, I'm keen to, to open things up to, to questions or comments from, from you all. So, so please, if you've, as, as we've been talking, if something has come, come to mind, please please do free, feel free to, to ask a question. We have um, microphones com coming round. So if you would like to ask or, or, or comment on anything, just put your hand up and I will, I will c come, come to you. I'll maybe give you a, a couple of minutes to, 
to start thinking. Mm -hmm. And just, just while, while you do that, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm in, interested, Frauke, in, in, in what you were saying there about the, the, the capacity to, to, support, to, support, to support young people yeah. coming in. And, and there, there's something about having, almost redesigning the way we think about business support, redesigning how, how, we, how we provide the, that kind of education in in creative courses, is there are there those elements that exist in in our, our school further and higher education uh, programs already, or is there is there curriculum development that needs to be done in that? Well, I I mean I'd like to I don't want to gloat, but um, we uh, the the creative informatics project is a good example because that was a very unique new approach of um, funding uh, universities. Um, we had um, the Creative Informatics project was a cluster um, of funding, and I have to read this up because there's so many numbers. It's just a good example because what we heard back from all the people that we work with, the creatives, was what helped the most was basically what we found out it was scaffolding, basically. So, so what we found out it was a five-year project that just basically wrapped up in uh, in April, and. We invested, so the Creative Informatics Project was a, a joint project with Edinburgh University and um, Edinburgh Napier University. And um, we invested in that project, we invested over four million pounds of R&D in SMEs um, uh, in for creatives, creative, creative R, uh, SMEs basically. And this led to a total of th over 33 million pounds um, gross value added to the Scottish economy associated with the programme to date based on current estimates of job levels generated or safeguarded by the programme. And we helped generate or safeguard 445 jobs in more than 130 projects in only five years. And we generated 45 spin-outs, startups, and pivots. And we oversaw 212 new project, uh, products, services, and experiences. And we trained 682 individuals. And that for an academic project, basically, that was, however, the mandate was to really fund creative SMEs, basically, right? And that was quite unique. And I mean, I was lucky enough because I transferred from Canada to Scotland only 18 months ago, and I was invited to join it for the last year. So I did very little. So it was a big team that worked on this effort you know, day and night basically for five years and they achieved that. And based what we heard back from all the creatives that worked with them was it was the scaffolding. Yes, it was the funding, the money, but it was mostly really the scaffolding, the networking, the, the help, the talking to them, um, the basically coming up, oh, I have an idea, how could I do that? Because, you know, writing a funding proposal isn't that easy, right? Or you know, and bringing them together and saying, you want to do this, we know someone else who wants to do something similar. So this is what I, what I meant. So when, when you have people that have ideas, and this is, was a big lesson we learned from that, that scaffolding basically, being there, um, being on the ground basically, um, with your ear on the ground and, and listening to them and having some funds, obviously that's really important, but also being there, knowing everybody. And that's the good thing, as you said, here in Scotland, everybody knows everybody, right? So we have a big advantage here, but having the support, having the framework, having the infrastructure, but then also being there. And um, the whole team in that project did a fantastic job. I just said, I want to do a shout out here. So go to the website, website creativeinformatics.org. They did a really great job. And they did also lots of training programs, for example. Um, um, yeah, so that, that is a good example, yeah. right? And we hope that there will be some more of this kind of cluster fund funding because it was a really good thing. It wasn't the typical academic project where we only do research, right? So we had this really strict mandate to fund R&D and work closely with creatives and, and it was a great success. Yeah. And, and sustain something that, that lives on and, yeah. and, and, and develops yes. and, 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 and grows beyond, beyond yeah. the project. Yeah. 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 Questions or comments from, from the floor? Oh, great. A couple of questions. I'll take, I'll take two or three. So I'll take the person on the end there. Hello, my name's Scott Bridges. I'm a self-confessed Luddite. <laughs> and uh, uh, a generation ago, I was influenced and, and inspired by the work of Sir Ken Robinson, who talked about uh, 
divergent thinking and, and the ability to generate divergent ideas uh, through the arts. Uh, what frightens the uh, hell out of me right now is this room isn't full. There should be tons of people in here because this is the topic of the day. How do we generate new ideas? And I think uh, the panel is on task, but it's, it's really scary to imagine that fewer and fewer people are going to have the ability to generate new ideas rather than more and more people. Mm -hmm. And I think that was uh, Ken Robinson's thought uh, 25 years ago, and, and it's, if anything, magnified tremendously now by the necessity of, of needing to be able to manipulate this technology uh, very early. You talked about playing the piano. I think that's, a credible, that's an incredible part of the musical experience or the arts experiences is trying to make art, trying to make music and what you learn in the process. And I'm not sure what AI uh, can replicate in terms of that learning that ultimately gives us great works of art, music, theater, and so on. Thank, thank you for that. There's a, a question of, just next to the, the camera up, at the back, the, 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 far, the far end of that row. Oh, two questions. Oh, Go, for <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. Um, you kind of touched on like the hiring process a little bit, but I just wondered, do you believe we're already at the stage where people that either are too scared or kind of refuse to use AI in terms of writing cover letters or putting together portfolios are already at a disadvantage in terms of the job market? Or do you think we'll soon be at that stage? Or are we already there? And do you want to just pass it along to the woman at the end who... I'll, I'll, I'll take three. So, um, sorry, I should declare an interest. I also work at the International Festival, so I'm a bit biased, but I was picking up on something Michelle said about the live experience being where that kind of human element will, will survive. And I was in the Queen's Hall yesterday morning listening to an amazing concert, the Cleo Quartet, and one of the brilliant things, it was a very vigorous piece, is kind of watching the viola player with a bead of sweat on her brow or seeing that the cellist had to kind of bite off one of her broken strings in between the movements. And I, I kind of love that um, experience of seeing the real human work of a piece of art. But I also have to remember that one of the most brilliant experiences I had last year at the other end of the spectrum was going to see ABBA Voyage, <laughs> which is a really interesting one in terms of AI because they're so confident, I don't know if anyone's been, that they will they put real live musicians on stage next to Agneta and Benny and Bjorn and Frida and you cannot see the join. And I, I just was interested in what the panel thought about where does that sit in kind of heritage music? I get. I think they're doing the same thing with Elvis. You know, what, that feels like an interesting grey area to me that a whole new generation of people will be able to see past musicians in a kind of synthetic form. Thank you. Three, three interesting questions. I'll, I'll come. We'll do another round. So I'll, 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 I've made a note of, of who else wants to contribute. Who wants to tackle big questions about creativity, about uh, deep faking? Um, or, or reproducing heritage uh, music, heritage artists, and, and then the question about, you know, are, are we too late around the fear? And uh, Michelle? Yeah, I, I think we're too late. You probably have seen uh, me referencing my, my notes here, but, um, I, I, and I want to quote as well, I was reading Professor Max Tegmark, uh, he's a leading expert in AI from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he was commenting about the pace of change. AI development, I'm quoting, is progressing so fast that many experts expect it to outsmart humans at most tasks within a few years. People need to understand that if we don't act now, it will be too late. And he says power has grown even faster when asked about uh, the current moment in time of AI. Power has grown even faster than I expected and regulation has progressed even slower than I expected. So I think that frames my, my opening remarks about quantum physics. The point of the matter is we're sitting here discussing it and it's light years from even the concepts that we are discussing at the moment and that's the challenge we've got. So then what do we do? We need to be optimistic and in that respect, picking up your point about the ABBA show O2, absolutely utterly remarkable what it's doing but 
what is, you know, what happens when the musicians aren't there either? You know, so it's a bridge point at the moment, and I can see that possibility. But again, one slight note of, of optimism, and again, where I can see benefits, for example, traditional music in Scotland, uh, we've got a pretty thriving scene here, but um, you could see how AI would be able to assess and evaluate patterns of music from long-held traditional melodies and use that to help facilitate the creation of new ones. So I've, I've just picked up on a couple of threads. I incline more to threats because of the pace of change in the technology and having been involved in politics, understanding how chronically slow regulation is. It's the same in any state, frankly. Uh, but we have to be optimistic and see the opportunity because that ABBA show is absolutely fantastic, the one you highlight. <laughs> um, Rosie, yeah. do you want to pick up? Yeah, I, on things? the question about, like, yes, writing cover letters and CVs with AI and everything. Yeah, I think at this point it's out there, everyone's using it, so I think, yeah, you should use it, but then you should edit it because people don't. So um, <laughs> I think... Yeah, it's almost at the point whether we like it or not, it exists and people will be using it. So it's almost like if you're not using it, you are putting yourself at a disadvantage. But if you can use your own creative, like if it's writing, if you are a good writer, bring that to the AI and you're going to make something better than someone else who's just put a prompt in and copied and pasted that. There is also, just to say on, on ChatGPT, there is a setting where you can... Uh, turn you can change it so that whatever you're putting in is not being used to train the model I don't know if it's true but um, if you're worried about kind of feeding the machine <laughs> in theory you can you can use it and I'm sure it's the same for the others and you can change your setting just to say that good little safety tip uh, for the, the the questions around where creativity because I think your, your, the, the initial question was, was you know, where, how do we sustain creativity? Because it is one of the things that make us human, mm -hmm. is, is that ability to be human. And, and we were talking, you know, is it possible that creativity within artificial intelligence or, or whatever we want to call it, is, is there a possibility that it becomes more than or better than the human brain or, or a collection of human brains, people collaborating, working together? I find, I find this comparative approach difficult, mm -hmm. right? Because creativity, I think, is the most useful, useful to think about as an expression of the human self um, to help us, right? To cope with reality, to cope with who we are, to understand better who we are. So as an expression of our, ourselves, this is how I understand creativity. And I also think it's very similar with the question of, is this creative? It's like, is this art, right? So we have to decide ourselves, is this creative or is this art? I see it even with my, with my, with my daughter. I think what she produces there and she's drawing is fantastic and it's creative. And then she goes, no, it's terrible. And she rips it apart, right? So... So comparing it to seeing what an AI um, module is doing and saying this is more creative than what I'm doing, that's not the point. As long as we can still find in ourselves what we do as an expression of ourselves, whether it's being done with an AI tool or not, as long as we find it as an expression of ourselves and it helps us to feel as and understand who we are, that's very important, I think at least. Maybe this is a very simplistic answer, but I think it's a very important answer. And I went around a little bit here to see what is being exhibited here. Mm -hmm. And some of the things here say that actually, right, as an expression of who we are. And also to help, for instance, with some of the mental health um, exhibitions here for children, right, to express what we think, what we feel mm -hmm. using creativity. So I think we should use that use that as a way, as a kind of benchmark, maybe. Maybe that helps it a little bit to see AI, in, at least in that respect, less as a threat. It's still a threat in terms of, you know, when people feel, and I can see that, to be made redundant, mm -hmm. right? So um, 
that never, yeah, absolutely, um, it's a true point. Should we say it's everything is too late anyhow? Um, I can see where this question comes from, and I, I think we should take that very seriously. But um, we can't allow ourselves to, to give in to that because we owe it to the younger generation, right? To say, no, we have to, we, we created that situation, basically, so we have to find a solution, right? And, and I suppose, in, in some ways, tying back to Michelle's point about the, the pace of change of regulation and regulation being so slow, that, that makes your earlier comments about the dialogue, the, the bringing, bringing communities of creatives yes. and others, you know, because we all have some potential to be creative, whether we, whether we think so or not, um, bringing, bringing people together to talk about it. So there, there can be the, the sort of community regulation, even if we don't have, you know, while, while political regulation catches up, because I agree, it's, <laughs> it's very, very slow and very, very frustrating most of the time. Um, so so, so there, there's something... I mean, We've kind of got, and I think we, we all guessed this conversation would, would go into more, more philosophical um, understandings of actually what is it to be human, what is it to be creative, how is it that, you know, so, somebody did design these AI tools using their creativity, using their, you know, how, how do we draw the lines of, of what, we, what we count as legitimate art or legitimate things, I, I think. That the, that these are some of the big questions, and we've probably all got our own individual answers to those. Michelle, you look like you wanted to. No, come no. In, no. Come I mean, in. I think uh, you've touched that. That is a philosophical question of the day, which talks to how and if we as humanity can utilise AI uh, to work for us at every level and strata of society. We've touched on many of the themes. The jury is out, I think, for me personally. That doesn't mean to say I can't be excited about some of the ideas and things that you could do. And we're kind of we're we've we've stepped we've stepped onto the conveyor belt and there ain't no going back. So I agree about we are duty bound to consider it for the, the future. But the philosophical element of because for me, arguably music has been one of the key defi definers of what it means to be human. That's my own personal view because I, I feel so strongly about it. And uh, that I'm not sure what the answer is. And furthermore, I'm not sure yet that it's moved beyond the academic discussions of which there are multitude underway and the underpinning ethics, which we've not really touched on yet. There's a lot of discussion underway around that. But the discussion in an academic sense is very worthwhile and valuable. But events have moved on, dear boy, quite considerably. And that's the point I kind of keep on making. And maybe if I go back to, you know, we have to try and be positive. We, we as human beings, at all points and in all places, have to endeavour to make our collective voices heard. We're sitting here today in the Scottish Parliament. I've got a good friend accompanying me today, and I was showing her around saying, this place speaks to the people and of the people. And therefore, when we use the analogy of AI, we have to do enough to make sure that it is a tool for humanity and doesn't replace humanity. Yes, it's got lots of positive benefits and there cannot be anything more crucial than our self-expression because that is what makes us human. Thanks. A couple of other questions. We've got somebody at the front here. Uh, the se second, second row, second row. Yeah, you. Yeah. Oh, all right. Thank you. Yeah, this is as a really um, a question and a comment to Michelle. Um, I'm in a small amateur music group, say 20 people. 19 of us play acoustic music, and we play for each other to varying degrees of of skill. You know, and and the and the creative bit is in the interpretation and maybe even the jazz improvisation. But there's one of our members is into AI produced music. Now, and this is the philosophical question on whether it's creative or not. What he's doing is not just saying, write me something in the, in the style of Marla. What he's doing is using the complete palette of sounds uh, and, and being able to produce voice as well. He's making the choices on 
what things he wants to add to the to the mix from this palette and then produces some really quite remarkable um, and innovative mm. music uh, and uh, and it occurs to me this is like a, a new instrument on the block you know so it's like the jazz players learning to learning to uh, use uh, utilize the saxophone um, I mean, not disregarding issues of um, of copyright and things, but it seems to me that is uh, that is a creative endeavour. What what, what this, this individual is doing? The interesting thing is, though, that the, the produced music is highly polished. You know, it's, it, it doesn't have all the all the squeaks and squawks of us trying to trying to play our, uh, our acoustic <laughs> instruments. But it's highly polished, and it and it's it. It is undoubtedly has gone through a creative process, mm -hmm. and I think you know, throughout time, new instruments have come on the block, and is this palette of AI-generated tools not just another instrument? Okay, thank you. I'll take the, the person in the yellow yellow top. Thanks. Thank you. I'm very much enjoying the conversation today, so thank you to the panel for that. Um, I should also declare that I actually head up an automation service, so I work very um, strongly in AI. I work with a, a critically acclaimed fine artist, and I have teenagers in the house, so that's going to frame the question. Um, I think um, we, we just need to be careful. I worry that we're focusing too much on the tool. So what we're going to do with AI, whereas I think there's, there's actually a root cause here, and it, it's what do we value as society. So I think a bigger part is how do we communicate that. AI is a threat but isn't removing things like music from secondary education or devaluing the creative process as much of a threat, if not more. My daughter, my teenage daughter, recently came into the room and boasted how she'd created something using AI and didn't even care about the creative that it had been based on. The success and the actual application of the AI was more important than the creative process. I think we've already talked about this, but it's also about not creating that tier in access to art. I, I worry a little bit about the exclusive we might be embedding but actually I worry even more that with certain groups that don't even understand or appreciate why that matters so actually electronic music fine I get it cheap you know and, and th these are some of the, the challenges in society and uh, uh, the, the, the man over there mentioned this as well I think I think we need to be careful part of the creative process is about being flawed and how can creatives teach that to communities? And actually, it's more about failing, trusting that as part of a process and moving the pursuit of perfection away from it being the end goal. And to end on a slightly lighter note, I think we also need to remember that AI in itself and the development of it is a creative process. It's a design process. And, and I don't think that's ever talked about. We obsess with the technology and the IT. And, and it's much more about us as humans. Yeah, thank you for that. And there's a question just the other side of the aisle. Thanks. Hi. Um, so this is less a question, but more kind of sharing my own experience. So by, by trade, I am a filmmaker and translator, sometimes both at the same time. And um, I, I don't deny that I'm one of those people whose head is in the sand um, about AI. Um, but... Um, Coincidentally, um, just last night, while I was working on um, some subtitle translations for a documentary, I thought I would attempt to speed up the process a little bit by feeding um, the script that I have into the AI and asking it to translate it so that I can do more editorial work um, rather than translation. But I, what I found is in that proce process was that... Um, uh, because with, especially with subtitle translation, there's a lot of um, formal el um, elements, uh, factors at play, um, as in um, how many characters you can have in a line. And um, so that would really affect how you, how you chop up a phrase to translate, um, mm -hmm. to preserve, not really preserve the syntax. You, you sometimes have to manipulate it a little bit. And, um, Last night, I, I ended up being really, really frustrated because just how getting the AI to this, the exact place where I wanted to translate took some time. And then when it happened, I, I ended up um, having to kind of rewrite the whole thing anyway. So in the end, I ditched it. And so I just found it a very interesting 
um, turn of events, so to speak, because um, what was kind of impeding what I w had wanted to achieve uh, creatively ended up being te technicalities. Mm -hmm. um, but then I also do see, um, should this, um, should AI one day become intelligent, really intelligent enough, it could really um, help me with the whole workflow. Um, but then I really, I'm in a, in a play, uh, because of the nature of my work, I'm not very worried about, oh, my, my um, my work, my profession being the place because of how how niche um, that I work. But I do see a lot of anxiety, especially within the translation community about being replaced by AI. Okay. Thank you. I, I've got two, two, two other folk on, on that side of the room, but I'll, I'll come back to the panel um, first. Um, Michelle, do you want to start with a question addressed directly to you and then we'll, yeah. we'll just move well, on? Well, the, the comment you make about uh, that, well, of course it's creative. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, and that's exactly the sort of example where that can bring something different. But the point I would make is the generative nature of AI, it's not just using the tech, it's a generative nature, will be learning that and able to incorporate further stuff. Uh, so the speed at which humanity needs to be able to run in musical terms to keep up with the learning of AI when you think about a whole variety of different styles. You mentioned about jazz. Yeah, the easy bit will be doing sequencing and you know, and some of the basic riffs that you would have in, in, in a jazz thing. That's the easy bit. When you start to incorporate other things, it's going to be much better. So yes, it's positive but the generative nature of it makes it slightly different. And it's that generative nature that makes me at least, as in principle, more alarmed about what the future might hold. And do you have any other comments on the other points that were... Yeah, well, I mean, of course, I mean, I think we could have a session in of itself on the philosophical and ethical elements. And I know there was a, a session yesterday about, you know, who cares was a point you're making about the creators and we absolutely have to care because that's the nub arguably you know the the, the stereotypical view of the the creative sitting at their desk and whatever you know struggling with it and cutting off bits of themselves such as the struggle so so great we have to care about that because i think that is closely linked to the the personal satisfaction one gets from the endeavour, and I would argue that makes us human. There's a lot of academic thinking about that going on, lots and lots of discussions about that, but I don't think it's yet reached the point where we're able to clearly articulate that's what it means for me today as a jobbing musician or a translator. And you make fair points. I think the general consensus is that translators will uh, no longer be required, at least in the scale that they are at the moment. That's the general uh, kind of consensus. But I'll leave you just with one final thought. The first time that, that I, I mean, obviously I was always interested in tech, but when I was in Westminster, we had a, a, a sort of day session with some academics at Cambridge University. And we were talking about at that point, that was probably 2015. And I said to this professor, who was very eminent, I said, but who will inherit the earth? in this bold new world. And his answer to me was the creatives, because the creatives will keep thinking of new ideas and new ways and using it. And that did leave me with some hope, although it was a long time ago. <laughs> and I mean, that, that comes back to the point you made earlier, Fraka, about the, the ability of us to create in so many different ways. What, what are your, your thoughts or comments on, on what we've heard from, from the audience? Members? Well, with the with the translation, yes, but I am I'm not that convinced that it will eliminate all the jobs. To be honest, because maybe also because of my linguistics background, yes, it's true. Um, I mean, the 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 progress it's made in the recent years is tremendous, but only in the main languages. I have to say. I mean, on the one hand, I'm really impressed by the 
the advantages of the LLMs now because now finally the, the robots I create can also understand me because I, <laughs> I, I have an accent so usually the robots with a let's speak English often don't understand me in, in the past never understood me it made me really angry right so but now they do understand me without a problem which is good but um, uh, but with the with the more less um, let's say main languages like like let's say English um, you know or, or Mandarin or whatever it's less so we just recently had a project that I, I finished where we were studying youth um, on social media in, in Central America and the Caribbean how they talked about serious topics and human rights and um, all the tweets we were trying to also used to standard you know standardized um, translation it didn't work right so it was the translation was really poor still so and i think um that will stay for a long time because it's just not lucrative enough to have um to really improve on the you know less popular languages for those big tech companies right so i'm i'm quite optimistic that we still will need a, a lot of expert translators for the smaller languages actually um when it comes to uh, to what we tell um teenagers um how to use um ai tech and i've I've started a while ago to talk about, we, we have fantastic, and I have the pleasure of working with really great um, scholars in media literacy, right? Um, and we need something like AI literacy for sure, and we need funding to develop courses um, for AI literacy in education, definitely. And those courses need to also include AI ethics for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is really, it's so relevant, right? AI literacy to tell, um, pupils, students from early age on how they protect themselves but also to make them aware of you know the importance of respecting other people's um, copyrights basically right or also the process what does that mean how to generate things using AI right and and these uh, these ideas I think that's really really important and um, but then to a certain degree, we also need to just trust uh, the natural um, matura maturation process of teenagers, I, I fear, probably, right? But AI literacy, I think that is a really, really important thing. We need to start developing um, courses uh, for schools, but also university, for sure. So I've been working in Canada. We, are, we were working on a training program for computer science and, and social science students to work on responsible AI courses and programs which are quite interesting to develop, yes. And, and I think your question about um, whether AI, this AI generated music could be regarded as an, its own instrument, it's quite interesting, yes, in a way. Um, I think it's a very philosophical question, it's a very interesting question to say, could that be a new instrument on the block, basically? Again, I'm not a musician, so I think you would be the best person to answer that question here. But. Yeah. It sounds like we've already got the title of one of our sessions for next year's Festival of Politics on the philosophy, philosophy and ethics of AI. But Rosie, was there anything you wanted to pick up? Um, just a few people mentioned about the creative process and that just made me think, yeah, I think that's something we should think about that actually, yeah, when you're making art, the most important thing really for yourself is the creative process. I think the problem is when capitalism comes in, mm -hmm. the most important thing is the product. Um, and I think that's, that's the disconnect mm -hmm. here. And, and, and that relates back to your point about the language you know, and translation. It's, it's not lucrative to do that. And, and you think, well, it, it, shouldn't be, it shouldn't be down to just what makes what's profitable. So, yeah. yeah. Couple, couple of last, couple, <laughs> couple of last questions just towards the front. Um, um, there were two hand, hands up. If you can just indicate, yeah, yes, yes, and then just behind you, and as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Just thanks very much. Just a couple of quick thoughts. Um, I think I'm surprised sometimes how quickly we forget the impact and isolation that COVID caused. And if you look at how hard it was for music, you know, like in some ways we were able to discover you could watch theatre from home, for example, but it's nothing like the experience of being in a theatre. Um, and the work that I watched individual musicians just online, I'm not a musician, but trying to keep an orchestra together but not be in the same room, you know? Mm -hmm. So 
I think that we don't want to lose that memory because it's uh, particularly worth talking about young people and following on from the point said about children. There's a whole batch of children in our schools just now and young people who've had two years of not being having the same social interaction, cultural, creative interaction. And so, yeah, so just to kind of say, like, we need to build that into the conversation. Um, the Children's Parliament, just a quick reference, but the Children's Parliament has been working with the Alan Turing Institute and uh, with Scottish Government AI somehow. Uh, but the first report has just been published. It's on the Children's Parliament website and they work with primary school children. And there's interest about AI and saying, you know, what do you feel? What do you want? What do you think? And one of the things that stuck with me from listening to them talk about that report was children saying, we still want the teacher. We still want the human. We still want the interaction. And the children themselves are saying that. And they're saying, you can't talk about AI for the future without involving us now. Children's voices, little children and primary school children need to be in the room now. Because we get, I mean, I know I do it. I guess what I think is going to be the problem or I guess what they're enjoying or, you know, like we've, you've got to talk to them. And the second thing, which is a quick international festival plug as well, I'm on the board at the international festival, um, is that there's a community hub project running in Broomhouse just now. I went out yesterday just for four days and they're doing a, a VR, a virtual reality. I've never done this before, like wear a headset and you're in the middle of an orchestra. Um, and it's just amazing. Um, and if anyone's got time between now and the Friday, it's well worth a visit. But I think that that may be something Rosie can pick up. But I think it's an interesting, both in terms of being in the community, but using, the, they've got dementia groups coming in to try it. They've, it gives you a, you know, the orchestra's all round about you in a way that you're never actually going to be in amongst. And I know it creates and plays with the sound and stuff, but it was amazing. And we'll open the door for a lot of people, I think. It just gives you something to then build on. So I guess that's the question. How do we build on some of the new things we've tried this this year and you know that are going well not just this year, but that are going on? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thanks. If you can pass it just to behind you. Thank you. Hello. Um, I wanted to just talk briefly about like the iterative nature of generative AI and the fact that most generative AI is only as good as this data set and the, the sources that it's pulling from and you can only generate within the, <laughs> the confines of what you know. And, <coughs> sorry, there's a, a question I guess around the certainly early generative AI models, um, for lack of a better word, are built on theft. They're built on pulling from data sources mm -hmm. that were not built on consent and then the, 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 the idea that people who own the intellectual property were not actually informed or consulted in how their data was being used, especially in, in a technology that's generated, you know, before there's a, even a public awareness of what that actually means. And so I guess the, the, the question is, is like, how do we, there's, there's a question around like artists owning their work and I guess what I'm trying to get is like the idea that AI can only ever be as good as the artists whose work it builds from and then how do we actually protect the rights of the artists and I did just want to add one other thing that was a horribly phrased question sorry. <laughs> um, which no one else has mentioned but I, I do think would be really pertinent to mention is just the environmental impact of AI and the huge carbon and water resources that are required to run the data hubs that generate this and that this is such a consideration for the future. It really, even more so than the, 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 the problem of AI, the environmental impact should be our number one uh, consideration and how we square that with this changing uh, reality that we currently live in. Th thank you. J just on that point, if you can, when, it, when it's online, we, we talked a little bit more about the, the, the ethical, from an environmental point of view, the ethical impact of, of AI Yes, in yesterday's session. And <coughs> one of the, the staggering things, which I, I don't think many people are aware of, one of the data hubs um, actually has preferential uh, 
the, the pre pre uh, uh, preferential uh, standing for if there's a power outage, they will get data before hospitals, before schools, before those kinds of things, and that's written into their agreement. So they're all sorts of really, really tricky questions um, in, 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 in that, which we don't necessarily have time, well, we don't have time to go in now. Um, so, yeah, we don't have time, panellists. But, but I, I wonder, on, on those last points, um, if, if I can just move, move along the panel this way. Michelle, do you want to kick off and, and we'll move? And, and if there's any last last point yeah. you, you want to make as, as I, we wrap I know up. we're approaching uh, the end of it. Your environmental point, yes, absolutely well made. But the counter to that is it could enable global creativity uh, and re restrict where we would have flown half around the world so we're not yet certain uh, about the impact from it and there's a much more complex discussion uh, to have in there I think your articulation of how it actually works in terms of mining data sets it, I think that probably helped everyone in the room but again I would make clear that the kind of exponential growth when you look at the scope and scale of these data sets drawn from around the world I still think that that's not necessarily understood that's the quantum if you like that makes a real difference and, and and your point I mean that's a very interesting one about isolation and one of the things that interests me from from the the COVID pandemic was the multitude of longitudinal studies that were mm. set up and what then how will sustained use of AI affect the development of neural pathways in children and again these are the sort of questions frankly we have no idea, or rather, what are the risks of how they're developed? And that links to your point about social isolation. So I think both of you have probably raised more questions for us in the panel, mm -hmm. which we don't have time to answer today. Yeah. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah. Rosie? Um, yeah, I think what you were saying about yeah, the... Um, I think, yeah, I do have a concern as well about people, writers now trying to sort of um, bring companies to court about you know, like Stephen King, I think, um, is saying this this thing that this AI is writing is definitely like ripped off of my books. I mm -hmm. I kind of think it's a bit too late because everything on the internet has already been put into those machines. Um, so I think that is a, a very tricky thing about copyright, where at the moment you can't tell where that um, AI has got its information from in the same way that as a person you can't remember when you learned what a cat was this example I was reading you know it you know how to recognize a dog and a cat but you couldn't say exactly where you got that information from as I understand it it's kind of the same with the machines so yeah I guess the question is just what we do now from now on I guess um and yeah and the example of the the virtual reality experience yes I'd recommend going I think that's a nice example about like technology but I guess it's not necessarily generative is the difference there I would say but how technology can make art more accessible um, yeah, interesting. Thanks, Rosie. Frauke? Yeah, I mean, that was also one of the questions that came up in our study. Um, definitely, how can you copyright something that you created, uh, a creative piece of art, for instance, um, that is based on something um, that was taken without asking um, the original creator? Definitely, that is one of the biggest problems. Absolutely. Um, so, there is no solution yet, and we urgently need a solution. Um, also to say it's too late, I think that, that's not quite fair. Also to say what uh, some artists say, to be copied is the biggest compliment for an artist. I, I could never subscribe to that, mm -hmm. but I'm, again, I'm not an artist, but it is a major problem, yes. And the environmental impact, absolutely. The, uh, the good thing is I know quite a few artists who have great ideas and creatives about this, and again, we, should, we have to include them, but yeah, what, what you just said is absolutely shocking. Yeah. Um, and again, it's, a, it's the call for money, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is awful, which is not surprising, but it's, it's usually, again, the call for, we urgently need regulation here. Um, and uh, my last word is just, we need to bring in, you know, the most vulnerable and um, those that most benefit. And we need to find, we just have to find a solution urgently. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. That brings us to the end of this session. I'd like to thank you for, for, your, your, for coming along today and, and for your contributions and, and questions. Um, please do, 
if you booked for the session by Eventbrite, you will get an email asking for uh, your feedback. Please do, do complete that. We've got a couple of paper copies at the back as well. It really helps us you know, think about how we design these kinds of conversations in future. But I think it's quite clear that there, there are still big questions around consent, around the ethics, you know, the philosophy uh, uh, of, of some of what we've been talking about. But for me, the, Frauke, your, your, your last point there about collaboration, bringing people around the table to talk about these things is, is, is fundamental to, to how, we, how we progress this. Um, if you are interested in continuing the conversation around AI, there's a session on Friday morning about AI and deep fake politics specifically. You know, we, we, we might touch on the other example too, but, but I, I, th I think it's going to be focused more, more on, on politics and the, the democratic uh, questions, questions of democracy and participation that that will, will bring. Um, so please do, do come along to that if, if you can. All that's left for me to do now is to say thank you very much to Michelle Thompson, to Rosie Castle and to Professor Frau Katzella. Thank you very much for, for your time and, and your contribution today. We've really, really appreciated it. Enjoy the rest of the Festival of Politics. Thank you all.